Well, uh, it's nice to be here today. Thank you. And um, my name is Jim. I work for the Conservation Foundation. We're a not-for-profit land trust. We cover Kane, DuPage, Will, Kendall counties, and we're being pulled into Grundy, LaSalle, DeKalb going west. We have sister organizations in Cook Lake, McHenry, all the way out to Rockford. And uh, I'll tell you more about it. Our main office is in Naperville at the base of Washington Street on Knock Knowles Road. 60 acres permanently protected with a conservation easement, so it can never be developed. You can see what the rest of the area would have been if it had not been for the protection of this farm. You can see right where the road would have gone right through the middle of the farm if, um, if developers had gotten a hold of the property. So we do organic vegetables there. We have butterfly gardens, solar panels, wind turbines, rainwater harvesting, green roof, um, all these wonderful green infrastructure things at the farm that you can see. And the farm dates back to the 1870s, but it's been updated with all this new green features. So there's a misconception people have. They come out to these meetings and they think that they're listening to a nature guy. And I try to bring out to them, it's not that I'm a nature guy. We're all nature people. We were, we came from cavemen and we, you know, the little house in the prairie, all the evolution of our, our beings came from being outdoors. And I don't know where this picture was taken. Nobody in my family can tell me. So I tell people that's my little sister. Uh, Cause I don't know where I could have found a chimpanzee, but, um, you know, whether it's me fishing or other things, um, I guided my son to his first big muskie. I was hiking the Appalachian Trail. We go on vacation. We see it's where we want to be is outdoors and away from the crowds of people. And in this a quote from Stephen Kellert, we will never be healthy, happy and satisfied if we're indoors. That's not where we came from. And so it manifests ourself, itself with us going to garden clubs, um, having pets in our yard. And I try to bring that out in people to say, you know, how often do you get to the forest preserve? And we don't spend that much time outside. So having a little piece of that nature in our yards where we can connect nature on an everyday basis is a really important thing. So I go to people's homes and help them implement some of these things and um, I developed the conservation at home program so um, to help them do it. And very simple terms. We don't do anything complicated. I show them right off the bat. This is what we're talking about. Nothing crazy here. Um, being aware of where the water is moving across the property. Um, less chemicals, less grass, more habitat for wildlife and diversity of nice trees that we need in our yards. So once we get past that and somebody says, well, that's not crazy. Okay. Um, the beginning point of it is that all of the life on this planet is plant-based. There is no life here without plants, just as flat as that can be. So this planet was conducive to plant growth. The plants started growing. They eventually created oxygen as they're releasing their um, oxygen that they give off and has created this atmosphere, which then made it conducive for other life to uh, come around. But plants are the only thing that can take the sun and turn it into food. So once we understand that plants are the magic, they are the kingdom of, of what drives this world, then it makes a difference what kind of plants we pick. And hummingbirds are on their way here, for example, and when they come, they're looking for food and they're going to scan your yard very quickly and say, there's nothing here for me. So if you don't see hummingbirds, it's because we haven't planted things that they want. So it's very simple. And once we start having people understand a little bit more, for example, on we understand evolution. We understand a turtle has a shell that can protect itself. We understand that a giraffe has a long, goofy neck for a reason, so it can reach the acacia leaves. But we don't see evolution in plants. And so in this depiction, you're showing how deep these plants go. That shadow is a human figure. And so these plants are going 8, 10, 15, 20 feet deep 
and opening up the soil and they protect themselves underground where they don't die in the winter. So they're perennial and the ones that did die are gone. So we're talking about these plants have lived here for 10,000 years in Illinois and they're stable and sustainable. Um, at the foot of that human is turf grass. And you can see there's no roots. You can buy rolls of sod and it, they don't have roots. They're not from Illinois. So the plants from Illinois are engaged in our wildlife. So if we pick things from out of the area, it's not that they're gonna be bad, but they're not connected to the environment. So our bugs and our birds are not gonna use those plants. They just don't know them. So I try to bring that education. Look at the beautiful plants we have in Illinois. And why aren't we using these? We're, we're engaged here. We live here, we work here, we go to school, all the things that we do in Illinois. Why aren't we embracing the plants of Illinois? This is at a nature center right in um, Downers Grove and showing people how beautiful these plants can be in a prairie kind of situation. Not everybody wants the prairie in their yard, so we have um, teachings about how to implement them in different settings. And I'll show you some pictures later on. The Conservation at Home program that I work with has now over 4,000 people that are participating all across the region. So the dark red ones, the bright red ones are mine. And the blue is another organization. The different colors represent other groups doing the same type of thing across the region. We have one group in Wisconsin, one group in Michigan, and all the way down to St. Louis, people doing these things. And businesses, so libraries, hospitals, uh, park district sites, you name it. We can put these on any kind of project, project whether it's residential or non-residential. A lot of schools are putting in butterfly gardens. Park districts are another one. They own a lot of land and not all of the land that they own is conducive to ball fields. And as we get older, we're not having kids playing soccer as much, but maybe we're walking our grandchildren or out with the dog and having these naturalized areas. I saw a mink swim across this creek. Um, I'm standing on a bridge here, but you can see by increasing the habitat, you increase places for other wildlife to live. This was a site in Naperville, and it was this ditch. The ditch had just mud in it, and we convinced them to stop mowing it and plant it with these plants. We're not calling it a ditch anymore. Now we're going to market this better and call it a bioswale. Now there's a place for that little bunny to hide. There's places for um, butterflies and other creatures to live, and we're not mowing as much. My granddaughter and my daughter-in-law were downtown Chicago and they found this milkweed that had found a way to grow in this little patch in Chicago. And you can see the larva or the monarch right there. And um, they put the monarch larva on her, on her arm and it was walking and she's getting all creeped out and they were snapping pictures. And uh, I ended up getting, a little container and I gave them two larvae in this container with some leaves. And my son called and he says, thank you so much for that. And he says, there's not two in there, there's three. And I said, no, there was only two. Another one had hatched apparently. So she named them banana, cocoa and super. And she watched them grow and then they pupated turned into, and she calls me and she says, Grandpa, they're dead. They're like, now they're in this J at the top of the container. And I said, well, they're not dead. Well, they look like they're dead. I said, well, this is what happens. And then my daughter-in-law, it was changing her life. So she's saying, she's an engineer. And she said, it's yellow and black and white. And it goes into this cocoon and it comes out orange. Now, any combination of yellow and white and black does not turn orange. And then it's like, you how does it can't do that in this little magic thing? And I said, this is the beauty of nature. We don't always understand all the concepts and what's going on. Um, it has a band of gold on the chrysalis, this bright gold. 
And you're like, well, where did that come from? Um, and then when it when it came out, um, I think it was banana that came out first. And she goes, that's not banana. Banana was a creepy little worm. And I said, that's banana. It's not banana. That doesn't look like banana. And they had to like discuss the changes this thing occurred. And that banana had to fly. This was in September. So banana and cocoa and super all turned out and they had to fly to Mexico. And my daughter-in-law saying, you know how fragile this thing is? We, we watched it turn into this very fragile little butterfly. It cannot fly to Mexico. And I said, well, it has to. It cannot survive the winter. So it either flies to Mexico or dies trying. Somewhere along the line, something will happen to it. But that's what it has to do. And it's driven. It has no mother that can teach it. So she was like, well, children need to learn from their mothers. And I said, I get it. But this is the child has all the knowledge it needs to survive, how to eat, how to drink. Out of where to find food, where they're supposed to be headed, all this stuff is pre-programmed into that tiny little egg, the size of a pinhead. And it was amazing to her. And they've since bought a house and she wants milkweed in their yard so that they can experience this again and again. So I go to people's yards and work with them on solving problems. I realized at an early point, people aren't going to make changes in, to their environment unless there's some benefit. What, what's going to do for me? I'm busy. I don't have time to do things that aren't going to give me return on my time. And so bringing birds and butterflies, solving water issues, making the soil better, all these positive things that I can help bring to them and sustainable things that are long lasting that they don't have to keep doing every year. Birds are an easy thing for me to sell to people. 50% of the bird count was these four species. Bottom left and top right are both invasive species. They don't belong here and they're overtaking the habitat. The other two do belong here, they're native, but they are overloaded here. They've adapted really well to suburbia and they've boomed their populations to the point that are causing other problems. So people, Look at the colors of these. This is not what people want in their yard. They want the native birds. And so to show them that to get these, you have to have food. And even with the hummingbird, you want the hummingbird to come to your yard. You put out the little hummingbird feeder. That's sugar water. And I mean, it's literally sugar water. And it's no different than me drinking a Pepsi that it's not going to give me sustainable food. I can take it. It gives me a little rush but it's not sustainable food. What they're eating is bugs. All the birds eat bugs. And this hummingbird lives off of ants. So they can eat seeds. They can come to these feeders. It's okay. But understanding that those are snacks. They're not um, all that the birds need. This grouping of birds will never come to the bird feeder. Even this little wren that you want to have come, he sings so beautiful they eat ants. So they can't get ants out of your grass. They get them from leaf litter on the, in, the, in the beds and in the forest. A lot of these birds will switch later on to berries. So if you want the cedar waxwing, indigo bunting, the oriole or the tanager, for example, they like berries later on in the summer, but they have to have bugs. So these birds are all gone. They're in the south where there's still bugs and they're coming here looking for our summer bugs. So just like a recipe, if you wanted to have a, a chocolate cake, you just don't randomly put things together. You follow the recipe and the same thing. If you wanted any of these birds to come to your yard, we have a recipe of plants that you'd put in that would bring the bugs, that bring the birds and the whole ecosystem is functioning. So birds are easy to sell. Butterflies are easy to sell. When I'm working with schools, for example, they all want a butterfly garden, but the bees are really what does the pollinating. 90% of the pollinating is done by bees, but nobody comes and says to me, can I get some more bees? Very few people say, can I have some skunks in my yard or snakes? So we have to kind of 
hide things. We put the beautiful butterfly out there. We have a butterfly garden and the bees come along under the radar. While people are looking at the beautiful butterfly, the bees come and do their work. So it's about marketing. And um, there are different types of milkweed. For example, we understand that monarchs need milkweed. I have a brochure here that identifies all the different butterflies we have and not just tells you the name of them, but what they have to have. We know that monarchs need milkweed and this milkweed has been eaten. Almost all the leaves are gone on these plants because of um, the larva, but there are different types of milkweed. So you might, this is common milkweed. You might not want that in your front yard. It's kind of tall and gawky looking. So if you want something ornamental, I'll show you the pictures of that. But there are ways we can feed these butterflies and give them what they need. All they want is food, water, and shelter. Pretty simple stuff. So I try to tell people about looking at the landscape. This is in Naperville, right at the village hall. And they said, could we do something with this piece of property? Well, this is Death Valley. I mean, this is the ugliest thing I can think of. So when they give me ugly, or I go to people's yards and say, where's the, where's your problem area? Where's the area that you is not functioning right? And they bring me to some site like this. Well, if I can fix this, then I become a hero pretty quick. And this is what we did with Naperville. We got a, a company donated that uh, stone walkway. We want people in there to smell it and see it and hear the sounds of nature. And not much has changed in the landscape, but the way people are using that site is completely different now that the landscape is better. So how would you do this on a residential situation? So these people called and they said, this is our house. We don't have any birds. We don't have any butterflies. We have problems. The problem was water coming out of the downspouts drained onto the sidewalk. And in the summertime, it was a problem with wet shoes. In the wintertime, it was ice. They had to put salt on the ice. Salt killed the grass. And we want to do something more eco-friendly for this lot if we could. Notice the big arborvita there. That was the first thing that went away. Look at the beautiful stonework. Somebody cut very um, beautiful stonework and brickwork there. Now that's all exposed again. We lowered the landscape relative to the sidewalk. So water is going to go to the low spot. The sidewalk was lower. Water goes on the sidewalk. We lowered the landscape on the side, created a place for it to go, and planted plants that are going to absorb that water, made a defined edge for the grass so it looks organized, and planted these native plants that are going to bring birds and butterflies. So I think it's better curb appeal. It's functioning, absorbing the water better, and um, you've created habitat where there was zero. So if you're interested in what types of plants are native and not, you can just Google them. Pretty simple stuff. You just Google where, where did this plant come from and you get where it came from. Grass came from Europe. Lilacs are a good example of a plant. It's not a bad plant, but you will never see bees or butterflies use, using a lilac. It just, it has no appeal for them. Now we get some appeal. It's pretty, it flowers, it smells. I'm not saying don't use these plants. I'm saying that they're not connected to our environment. So they're decorative as opposed to functional. And inside the house, we're going to stay with functional stuff first. We start with the kitchen, the stove, the refrigerator, the couch, the bed. And then we build around that and we put in some flowers or pictures on the wall piece of carpeting, whatever we do, it's all decorative things that make the area a little bit nicer, but we, the base of it is still the functional part. Now, when we step out of the house, we need to think about function too. If we lose function, we're not going to have the birds and butterflies. We're not going to have water absorption. We're not going to have uh, a landscape that's working. We're doing the wrong things at the parks and in homeowners associations. So on these edges of these ponds, I don't want to put a blanket down and have a picnic here with my granddaughter. You know it's loaded with chemicals. I don't see any dandelions. And 
Goose poop is going to be all over there. You've got eroded shorelines. You've got a problem. And it's not good for me. It's not good for the kids. It's not good for a lot of different situations, but we cover a lot of our areas with grass. Problems on creeks too, the same situation. We have to rethink the way we're thinking of having that short grass root system right next to water that's eroding. And the answer would be go back to the way it was. And I have to sell the homeowners who aren't used to this different look, but the geese are gone. Geese are terrified of walking through a prairie. Their biggest um, predator would be a fox, a coyote, or a dog, and they cannot see them. Geese are kind of fat and they don't, it takes them a while to get off the ground. They need some area to run. They want grass. And they have a visible, visible area that's larger when there's grass. They can see the things coming. They will not walk through this. So the geese typically would not go to this site. You're going to see herons, egrets. You have <clears throat> areas where these plantings come down to the water. Those plants are absorbing pollutants out of the water. You've got frogs and crayfish in that area. So you're <coughs> excuse me, more likely to find bass. Fishing could be better, the water quality is better. And the geese are gone. They used to sell fertilizer. The number on the bag, that 32, this is a $50 bag of Scott's fertilizer. Heavy on the nitrogen. Your grass does not want that nitrogen, doesn't need it and it's washing off into our river systems. So we're right next to the Fox River here. It's running brown today. It's loaded with nutrients. And all of our lakes and ponds across the region are loaded with nutrients because people love grass. The best water in, the, in Illinois, you gotta get out to Galena or Southern Illinois where less people live. And there's a direct relationship with volume of people and poor water quality. The worst water in the state is Chicago River. And if I asked you where the most densely populated area, it's direct correlation. We cover the United States with grass. The green states are grass dominated states. Illinois, for example, has more grass than corn and soybeans together. And grass is not productive. It has zero wildlife value. And the only states that are not grass are mountainous, desert, or sparsely populated states. So people love grass. And we look at the numbers, $40 billion annually, 20 million acres of a biologically dead surface. We have to water it, we have to care for it. It was brought over by Thomas Jefferson, was the first one that is credited with bringing grass over. And he had a whole staff that was taking care of it. Very costly, but he didn't care. He wanted to have something different and he wanted to have this aristocracy feel of I have this very costly surface, but that's because I'm rich. And from that, everybody wanted a little piece of that action. We've now covered the United States with turf at an average of $500 per household. So left or right, this is right in Geneva, on the Fox River, downtown Geneva. Left or right, which one's prettier? Which one's blooming in the middle of the drought? One side's brown and dying out. One side's in the full bloom. What side are you most likely to see birds and butterflies? That orange, by the way, is milkweed. There is a beautiful knee-high butterfly milkweed that has very thin leaves. It's nothing, doesn't look anything like the other milkweed, but it still functions the same way in that monarchs will eat it. Um, clumps of things, organized, lower profile. We're using things I teach at COD about how to landscape in a way that's going to be pretty and still functional. We created a pollinator meadow. So if you go to Fermi or some other places like that, you, you've seen the prairie and it's typically tall and people are not going to have that on library grounds, uh, college campus, um, industrial park, business place. They don't want that tall prairie. So we're calling this a meadow. 
And when I did my research on this name, the meadow, uh, I asked a bunch of people, um, what do you think of when I, you hear the word meadow? And the number one answer was Julie Andrews and the sound of music. And I said, okay, hold that thought. Uh, the second most popular answer was when Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz comes out of the scary forest and she sees the Emerald City across this field of flowers. And I said, well, hold on to that thought. So I try to sell the concept of a lower, more flowery area. And um, can we sell that? So we have it at our farm. Ours is um, 25 feet wide and 1,400 lineal feet along the regional bike trail. And I sold it to the tollway and uh, IDOT along highway areas. We're moving to this. So this is called the front slope. And they want that mode, but it's broken car parts and salt. And I don't really care about that. But the back slope is now being planted with these native plantings. They absorb water. That ditch on the bottom is no longer holding water. It doesn't sit there with water in it and create mosquitoes. You have uh, all those root systems that are sucking it up and letting it get into back into the ground. 50% costly, less costly to maintain because you're not mowing it all the time. And it does need maintenance. You have to weed it or burn it, but um, it's still way less than trying to mow. I do a lot of education about trees. People lose the, the story in a tree is a tree, and that's not anywhere near true. There are good trees, there are bad trees, there are all the trees in between. And you can rate trees. In um, Doug Tallamy's book, he rates the trees by value to the environment. Oak tree, number one. And hickory linden down the line. Um, some of these trees are not being utilized very much. We've created a non-balanced um, tree system. We had way too many ash and they all got killed. We had way too many elm before that and they all died from Dutch elm disease. Now we're overloaded with maple and honey locust. And both of those are threatened by this new beetle that's come from China. So I don't know what's gonna happen, but we shouldn't be having maples and honey locusts. We're up 30% of our tree population in those categories. And that's way too high, probably double what it should be. And if we have the trees in our yard, this couple said to me, well, we bought the house because of these beautiful oaks. These are white oak, by the way. And the, I told them the worst thing you could do is have grass. Grass and trees don't go together. They never have. If you went to the woods in any of the forest preserves, these wooded areas, they don't have grass in the woods. They have open plantings right now. The Virginia bluebells are blooming, all these beautiful wildflowers. So I told them to get the grass away from the tree as much as you can, get it away from the tree. Part of the problem is the trees can't breathe and, and get water very easy. So they, you see roots coming up in the grass. That is a tree telling you I'm not breathing well. So it doesn't always kill the tree right away, but it weakens the tree. At some point there's storm damage or bugs get in the tree or something else. They're not living as long as they used to because of the grass around them. Secondly, is all these leaves that fall. The leaves are the food for the trees next year. So when the leaves are done doing their photosynthesis thing in the fall, they fall to the ground. They're supposed to, they're rich organic material that would feed that tree. And yet we can't keep them there. We have to rake them out of here because there are, you know, they're on our precious grass. So people are bagging and hauling all these leaves away, which is the food for the tree. Another thing, soils are really poor in a lot of our areas. We have heavy clay soil. This organic material is really what the soils are screaming for, and we're bagging it and hauling away. What would you have, what would the shade look like? Those are Virginia bluebells on this side. Here you're looking at wild geranium. That grass-like stuff there it looks like grass, but it's not. It's sedge. And wild geranium. Um, here, that's woodland flocks. There's Solomon seal, there's sedges. Uh, a variety of uh, wildflowers can be found in the woods. 
and this is this time of year is the perfect time to go walking in the woods. If you have shaded areas and you want to know what it would look like, go to the forest preserves in those wooded areas and walk through there, those areas. And all of those plants are available for your yard. We've been paving over everything. I'm sure you see it in Aurora here where, where there used to be open fields or now Walmarts or Costco's gas stations and it's a direct relationship to what's going on. So it used to be that pipes brought pollution to the Fox and those have all been stopped. It's not coming from pipes anymore. It's called non-point source pollution where it's coming from runoff, drains, we're bringing salt, we're bringing uh, coatings from the driveway, blacktop um, debris is ending up in the river in measurable amounts that's hurting the fish and the um, micro biotic life in the river and water carries a lot of material with it, both soil, salt, chemicals. And how would we mitigate some of this? In this picture, they wanna have a yard and they're gonna have some true green or somebody spraying that yard, but they're mitigating some of the effect, the negative effects from the yard by planting a buffer on the outside. You're looking at obedient plants and cone flowers and black eyed Susans and sunflowers, all that are growing there with that root system that's going to absorb that nitrogen off the grass so that it doesn't wash off into the river. So we use rain barrels and rain gardens. A rain garden is a way of putting a name on something. It's low spots in the yard or these purposeful ditches that were built alongside the roadways to transmit water and we're planting them with plants that are going to absorb water and in those wet props and areas of the yard that you might think of as problems are also perfect place to grow plants grass doesn't do well there but in this picture you've got a road that's high and the water's coming down to the drain a lot of people will say well i have the drain in my yard but i don't live anywhere near the river and that misconnection of that drain is a system. It's engineered and planned with piping across the whole town that just dumps it in the river. Um, so we're planting in front of the drain in an effort to absorb that water and keep it out of the river as long as we can. So we work with all the counties on educating homeowners that we don't want to just flush that water out of here. Water is good. We want to absorb it into the soil and not flush it in the river. The other side of the pipe is the problem. And this can, you can see these all over the area where um, it's bringing that pollution into the river. So in this rain garden that I was here, this picture I'm here with my boss, we're creating a low spot and we're gonna, that rubber mat that's up there, we're gonna cover from behind me there with the rock. We're gonna put it on the rubber mat, the rubber mat's tipped. So it gets that water away from the basement. And notice the air conditioner unit over there. Air conditioner is now covered by a viburnum shrub that the birds love. And this rain garden is gonna absorb water. We don't have to mow it. And you're looking at the white is penstemon digitalis. The digitalis heart medicine is derived from that plant. It uh, brings hummingbirds in in the spring. The blue is spiderwort and the grass on the edge here, this is a dry lemon grass, prairie drop seed, and it can actually eat gasoline. They're using it in um, gas stations, in depression areas where the water collects in a gas station. This can tear apart gasoline into the carbon atoms and utilize it as food. So these plants are doing a whole lot more than we really see them, or we understand what they're doing. And I try to bring that out to people and tell them. Um, I've created some pieces for my conservation at home program. This is the Sony Library. You probably had a book called Plants of the Chicagoland Region. And it's um, by Swink and Wilhelm. It's about the size of an encyclopedia. And I swear, 10 seconds and you're saying, I can't do this. And you close the book. So I made this easy guide for people. Um, the color codes are for height. So if you want something short for the front sidewalk, 
medium is yellow. If you want something tall to hide the utility box, you flip the page over. There's some descriptive on how to use them around the yard. There's little icons that say, I like water. Birds like me, butterflies like me. I like sun or I like shade. Little ideas to kind of help you. And then on the back it says, email Jim when you're still confused. Um, I've got information on rain barrels. We're up to 16,000 rain barrels that we've sold across the region. The conservation home program, if you want to have somebody come out and walk your property, we can solve all those particular problems. This one is where it not only tells you what the butterflies are, but what they need to lay eggs on. All of that information in this one. And last was on rain gardens. If you have issues with water, then this is the thing that you want to be focusing on. There's two types of areas. So the, the low zone. In this area, the green is the low, the lowest part that will be wet more often. And the brown part of the outside are drier loving plants. And there's pictures of these plants in the back. And again, then it says, if you're still confused, call Jim. So um, you might see these signs across the town. We've got dozens of them in Aurora. And it's about people trying to do something better. It doesn't mean that your yard is perfect, um, that you're making an effort to try to make things better. And um, I'm doing everything I can. We've, one of the presentations I, I did, you know, that we've all heard that phrase, well, it's the least I could do. Well, I'm trying to do the most I can do, and that is go to your house for free. So, um, anybody has any questions about what I presented today? So if that's the case, then feel free to take material on here. All of my contact information is on it. And I want to help you in your journey if I can. I have a question. Thank you. Do you ever run into like problems with city codes? And, you know, like certain heights for things or... Not necessarily. Absolutely run into city codes. I was in um, Villa Park. They had an ordinance that um, prohibited milkweed. Really? And I went there and discussed with them that they're spending a bunch of time talking about this plant or that plant. There's a state list of invasive species. And if they just adopted that list that somebody else has determined, you can focus on your problems. And milkweed would not be banned um, in landscapes. There are ordinances in every town. So depending where you live, you have to follow the ordinances to some degree. Um, but there's ways to do it. So no town bans native. And you just have to use the guidelines. And more and more people are understanding that this is the way we need to go. So it isn't an odd idea. And can you remind us of the book that you mentioned that rates trees? That's that book called? Um, the, which book? I thought you said there was a book that rates trees. Oh, um, Doug Tallamy's book. Um, so he's got three or four books, um, Doug Tallamy. Okay. And then um, there are many books, but I think now we have the power with the library and other places to get these books or read online. So I encourage everybody to educate themselves a little bit more about it. Great. Thank you. Let me just think so jim but thank you so much this that was wonderful so sure. i appreciate you being here
Yep. So we would encourage people to take the grass out from as big of a ring as you want. So if you went to Morton Arboretum or anywhere else, you're seeing tree rings, even in the parking lot out here, there's a tree ring. And pulling it back, putting wood chips, a lot of cities you can get wood chips for free. Okay, so the bigger the better. If the, if the roots are coming out farther than when the mulch is, Bring the mulch out farther. Um, plant things in there, like the things that I showed you. You can plant things in it. Doesn't have to be barren with mulch. Would be my recommendation. Um, so I would do well with having conservation. Oh. Sure. Yeah, and just give you some ideas. It's usually me. Um, and the heavy clay, you can yeah. amend your soil a little bit with gypsum. It's inexpensive bag of stuff you can get at any home center. And you can spread that on the lawn, uh, gypsum counteracts clay to some degree. Um, but what the soil is screaming for is organic. So composting using, um, you can buy compost bags, uh, it's usually horse manure that's been say right. mushroom compost, yeah. um, work that into the soil so that you're counteracting all the good stuff as, and it, it's kind of odd uh, that people don't get the idea, but the topsoil that's on top, the reason that it's there is because of the native plants um, grew it. So it, it's, the clay is down below, but all this rich stuff from the leaves falling from all the plant roots and different things made it rich soil. And then the developer like took that all away and they sell it. And then they give you a little bit of topping on the top again, and then the clay. So it's all the time I see. So you have to go back to A, planting things that are used to clay and are meant from Illinois. So not putting in the lilacs or the hydrangea. There, there are native hydrangea that do pretty well. And, but if you get the ones that are like genetically modified and some of these ones that are all, you know, um, tricked out, they may not survive. We're planting a bunch of stuff that, you know, um, isn't native to our area. And so you're plunking it in clay and it never was in clay area before. It looks really good at the nursery because it's in a pot with engineered soil and it's doing really well. And then you take it out of that and you put it in your rock hard clay. So any, any of your beds, I would tell you to dig a hole Put leaf, fill it full of leaves in the fall, put the dirt back on top of the leaves, the leaves go into the soil. If you can compost areas that um, we sell composters, if you're in a subdivision or a condo time, you know, uh, defined area, but if you have a home, you can do composting and it's wonderful. Yeah. Take all that kitchen scraps and that turns into organic material, put that back in the soil, turn it over, improve your soil over a period of time. Yeah, loads of them, and um, I can give you my card. We have uh, on staff. We have educators. 
Okay. And so they're doing STEM programming. Mm -hmm. We're working at Aurora University and other places to try to not only change the landscape on the campus, putting a butterfly garden and playing gardens and stuff on these campuses of the school, but also educating the students about why we need to move in that direction. So we have, um, I don't do, I do adult education typically. So I'm at college level, um, but we have all the curriculum, the teachers, you know, the materials that they can work with. Sure, thank you. So I have a question um, related to James. It says, for a very small garden, can you recommend a few perennials that will work seeds? Absolutely. Um, there's one called Bee Balm, Menarda Fistulosa, or, or Menarda Digima, um, Black Eyed Susan's Cone Flowers, uh, Milkweed. Is, right, absolutely as nectar. Um, Coreopsis is a really nice um, low you plant. Here. You're welcome. Um, so any of the prairie type plants, I think the, the ones that are native. And what do you feel, or this isn't the first question, but I just reading about milkweed Does that help with seeing something? It's it's misdirected. Is it? So the idea is we want flowers for pollinators in the spring. But the pro problem is by telling people don't mow, that's not directing towards the pollinators. Okay. And so if you have um, True Green or one of these companies spray your lawn, yeah. there's nothing in your lawn to begin with. Okay. So go ahead and mow it. Sure. But on the other hand, if you have dandelions, if you have... Um, I have bluebells. I have these poppies, native poppy, um, clover, really good. So creating flowering stuff in the spring is the goal. So if you had, if you don't spray your lawn and you've got all these flowers in it, then reducing your mowing, at least till like Mother's Day, might be a good idea. Um, or pronging the dandelions out instead of spraying the herbicides on everything. So um, the no mowing thing needs a lot of of discussion for people to get to really understand what we're trying to accomplish, not just the non mowing. Yeah. So it, it's education is the, is the answer, and um, I try to in all these programs to get. Take it one step farther. We didn't have a good turnout here. Hopefully, people watch it on Facebook. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have connections to the other libraries, tell them, you know, we offer the programming for free. Get to the schools, whatever we can do to try to make this more mainstream. Yeah, carpentry. Well, my first one. Well, sometimes giving them something. I, um, I worked with my son. I went to my son's house to babysit. Yeah. Um, I went to babysit his house on Friday before Easter. And he, we were walking around the yard and he had, had a woodpecker. And he says, yeah. the darn thing is, you know, making a hole in my siding. And I told him, I said, well, the woodpecker wants a home right now. And there aren't any dead trees in our subdivision. So it has to try to make a home. It, it wants to lay an egg and what, you know, all these things. And so I suggested to him that, you know, in a perfect world, you make a, a woodpecker house and give them. And he says, well, where would I put it? And I said, well, the most logical place to put it would be right where he wanted to go, put it there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he literally won't be able to peck on that spot anymore. And he's used to coming to that spot. And so yeah. I was amazed by it. That was on Friday. On Sunday, when I came for Easter, the house was up there and mounted on. And he had made this beautiful, It's he cut the roof at the same slant his roof was, the roof on the, on the birdhouse was. And he said the first thing it, the bird did was go in the house. Now, I don't, you know, I don't know yet if it's going to nest in there, but um, it's about 
the carpenter bees are looking for wood that they can do their things. So sometimes an old log or some, you know, again, you're in a situation where you can't mend the landscape too much, but, you know, creating what they want, <laughs> plants and plants, give them something, you know, they're, they're looking for something. They're telling you, I'm looking for something. I have my, I have a bird bath. And when the thing is empty, you, you wouldn't believe the birds start making noise and, and they're like looking at me saying oh, like, come on, work? you got a bird bath here and the thing is empty, you know? So um, that listening to what's going on in nature and trying to solve it if you can. Yeah, I've read all this, you know, with the bees and the woodpecker. And they are coming right from the park. So if I could put some home or houses or something. Might help. Yeah. All right, I'm going to end this. Thank you, everyone, for joining us online. Yes.